everybody, and welcome back for another episode of the unofficial WCC Hoops podcast. I'm Zach Farmer, and we are a little more than a month away from the start of college basketball season, which is really exciting. We're starting to see more prognostications, more previews be put out, more more talk about what we're going to see this college basketball season. And with that, we're also going to start talking more and more about what we're going to see in the WCC and how it's all going to shake out once we get started in November. And so we're going to touch on a couple of different topics. We'll go into some injury news. Uh, we'll also uh, have a quick chat with uh, direct Jack Cronin, the uh, San Diego Toreros play-by-play man. Um, and we'll talk about everything U- USD, the changes at the coaching staff, a ton of newcomers on that roster. Uh, but first, before we get to that, I think there's this one que- this question as we kind of enter into the season. There's always kind of like this, this question in the WCC about who – there's always a team who kind of like leapfrogs and makes a big jump. And who is that team going to be this year? And is there a chance that some team is going to break into the top four? And I think that like from time to time, we saw that with Santa Clara last year, who leapfrogged all the way up the third USF was there at fourth Uh, for the first time. BYU had dropped, dropped the fifth. Uh, But then we also saw some, some leaps from Portland. We saw, we saw some strides from San Diego early on in conference play before uh, they hit a really rough patch at the end of the year. So who is going to be, who's the team that has the best chance to break into that top four this season? At least looking at the teams who were maybe in the bottom half of the league. And so I have three that really kind of like come off the top of my head as being those teams. That being San Diego, as we talked about, Pepperdine, and then also Portland. So let's kind of like look at each one of them individually. And I'll start with Pepperdine. Pepperdine does have a lot of talent. There's there's no doubt about that. There are three young stars between Max Lewis, Houston Mallet, and uh, Mike Mitchell Jr. All three who were all freshman team uh, members last year. There's... This is some high-powered offensive talent on this team. And as the season went on, all of them got more consistent. Houston Malik raised his um, point average to points in conference play. Max Lewis, who was banged up early in the year, we really got to see kind of come into his, not fully come into his own, but we really started to see what capability he had as we got into conference play. He only started two games, so there was still uh, some growing pains for him as well. But they also have the toughest hill to climb. This was a team that finished 10th last year. This is a team that was the worst defensive team in in the WCC. Allowed the most points, allowed the highest uh, field goal percentage, opponent field goal percentage. And this is where I'm not, I am to to jump from, say, 10 to 4 to 3 seems like a lot. It seems like that that might be too tough a hill to climb, at least in my mind. I I do think the Pepperdine is going to make a fairly, is going to move up. It will not be in 10th this year. That will not be where Pepperdine lies. But they also have kind of a lot to prove. And I think that that's going to, I think that helps Pepperdine. But at the same time, I think it's like, even though obviously like everything kind of starts from scratch and everything else, there's still a lot of the piece on that Pepperdine team who remember what 10th place felt like. And while I think do enough to make sure that they're not 10th anymore, I just don't know if they're going to make that huge leap. Now they might make say like a, a Portland type leap I mean, Portland went from 10th to sixth. I could see that as being very possible. Uh, but for Pepperdine, I feel like that that's just not, they're not quite that team, even though I think they're going to be in this conversation and be in the mix. Like I, I'm not going to doubt that they will be in the mix, uh, at least in the conversation as we get deeper into conference play. Then let's talk about uh, San Diego. San Diego, there's a there's a lot of intrigue, I would say, about San Diego. And there's a lot of expectations already for San Diego. Uh, John Rothstein uh, put out just the other day that uh, San Diego is one of the five teams that 
is expected to have the biggest leap uh, in expectations and in success this path in this season. Steve Lavin comes in as head coach. We kind of know his reputation. He's he has twelve years of coaching under his belt, eight NCAA tournaments, two NIT bids. He has success and he has it quickly. Uh, and especially if you look at his St. John's run, he he got there at a program that was really trying to still like figure itself out, and he was able to turn that program around fairly quickly. Now, again, like it's maybe a little easier to recruit and get guys into a Big East program and kind of turn that around than it might be for a WCC program. But at the same time, we've already seen how quickly he can move at getting new players in the door. San Diego has already brought in 12 newcomers. We know about Jaden Dallaire from the transfer from Stanford, Eric Williams, a transfer from Oregon, and then Nick Lynch, the transfer from Lehigh, who I think is one of the more interesting transfers and I think is going to be one of the key components for San Diego because one of the things that we know in this league is that you have to play the post well. When BYU last year lost basically its entire front court due to injury, that devastated their season. And when you, especially when you look at the top at St. Mary's and and Gonzaga, those are two teams that always have deep, solid front courts. And if you're going to compete with them, you have to be able to rebound. You have to be able to protect the paint. You have to be able to defend down low. We saw that with USF last year. USF, I think no one doubted that with uh, Khalil Shabazz and Jamari Bouye, they had one of the best front courts in the in the nation, let alone the WCC. But they didn't have the front court to help them out early in their careers. When they finally did last year with uh, Yawan Masalski and Patrick Tape, they finally got over that hump and got into an NCAA tournament. So I think this will be one of the things that San Diego is going to have to be focused on because they have a ton of talent. It's a matter of putting it together and whether or not they can piece everything together as they answer WCC play and then sustain it through comp through the course of the season. So, so they're going to be in the conversation. I think that they're we're going to see San Diego somewhere in this mix. But the one I'm looking at, the one I see who has the best shot at breaking into that top four is going to be Portland. We saw the rise of Portland last year. This was a team that was dead last in the WCC, was dead last in the WCC basically for the last five to six years before last season. And I think a lot of people thought that it was going to take some time to get Portland out of the hole they were in. And what Shantae Leggins did in year one was nothing short of amazing. He took a team that was dead last, dead last, dead last, and turned them into a very competitive team almost immediately. Brought in a lot of players that he was familiar with from Eastern Washington. Brought in a lot of brought in players who were going to fit his system. And this is a team that won 19 games last year, which was the most that they had won since 2010, 2011. And they kind of had the opposite of San Diego's conference season, where San Diego kind of started well and then tapered off. Portland started started poorly and then revved up at the back half of the season. And we really got to see how, how they started to build momentum toward the end of the year. They knocked off USF uh, up at the hilltop. We saw them start to be really competitive with teams that were also competitive, that were also good teams. They also beat San Diego in the WCC tournament, who they leapfrogged in conference play. And you have a lot of that team returning. You have the Moses Woods, you have the Mike Meadows, you have Tyler Robertson, who are all coming back. At some point, they will get Chris Austin back, uh, who who was recovering from a serious leg injury that he suffered in the last game of the season last year. So there's a lot to like about where they are. And then some of the transfers they've brought in are really interesting and should actually kind of help where they did have some, some gaps. One of the areas, obviously we kind of knew like they have, they had the backcourt, they had the shooters, 
They needed someone in the post, as we talked about, post play, post play, post play. Uh, the Milwaukee transfer, Joey St. Pierre, is really, going to be a really interesting piece and probably fills a, a need that they had. Uh, he had he averaged 5.7 rebounds last year, a block over a block a game. This is a this is a team I think that is primed to shoot for that top four window in the WCC. I'm not saying that they're going to do it. What I'm saying is that they have the best shot because if you still look around BYU for everything that's been happening, they are still one of the more talented teams. If you look up and down their roster in the conference. Whether they put it together or not is a different question. USF, I think, has garnered enough cachet now that they've proven that they can be that they can remain near the top. Some of the transfers they've brought in again, like they had a lot to the replace. They had to replace Masalski. They had to re- they have to replace Bouye. Now I don't think there's quote replacing Bouye, but that is that is something that they have to kind of replicate in some sort of way. Shabazz, um, Shabazz is going to be a big part of how they do that. As, as well as like Marcus Williams and then also um, Tyler Roberts. Like there are going to be guys on that roster that they're going to actually be looking to to be able to fill some of that role. Uh, looking at Julian Rishwain is another guy we're probably going to see a lot more of uh, this coming season. And so as I kind of look at like, there's going to be so, I think there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of jockeying in the middle of the league. I could see very well that there's going to be a bunch of teams with records like nine and seven, eight and eight, seven and nine. I don't, I think, I think a team that could get to 10 wins is going to be good enough to get into that fourth slot. So it's kind of like where we were last year. That's how USF was. USF, I believe, was 10 and five. No, they were 10 and six. And that's that was good enough for fourth place. They finished the half game behind Santa Clara, uh, who was 10 and five. So that that's kind of the line. It's like you need kind of need to get the 10 wins. But then again, but I also don't think the bottom teams are going to be as good. So you know what? I take it back. 10 wins, I don't think is going to be necessary. I think nine might actually do it to end up in fourth because I think that there's going to be so much competition between. USF, BYU, Santa Clara, San Diego, Pepperdine, Portland, that these teams are really going to beat up on each other. And it's going to be one of the more competitive conference seasons I think we've seen in a long, long time. Now, as we kind of like start to transition and one of these teams, again, is San Diego. And we there's so much we don't know about this team because of the new coaching staff, the new the new players, some of the returners, and how they're going to fit back into this new system and whatever this ends up looking like. Can we take anything from what we saw last year into account for this year, outside of maybe some of the potential we saw from Marcellus Erlington or what we saw from Wayne McKinney? But let's talk to someone who actually knows this team better, better has saw, seen this team over the course of the last few years is and also in the building so we'll go ahead and bring in uh jack cronin all right so i'm going to bring in jack cronin he is the play-by-play man for the san diego toreros he's also you can also find him with the pac-12 network and also uh broadcasting with uh, the san diego loyal and there's they're just entering into the usl playoffs so like, that's pretty exciting for you Absolutely. And it's at USD. So yeah, they're going to at least get one home match at Torero Stadium at USD, which has been a great host, wonderful field. And so it's great to have that crossover here uh, as we get to the last part of the year. Yeah. And as we're starting to kind of like rev up into like, as so- some seasons are starting to wind down, so- uh, soccer starting to wind down, we're now starting to get into basketball. We're starting to all to see the prognostications, all the previews and everything else. And one of the big ones has been San Diego and what they could potentially do this year. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of changes over the course of this past summer. What's been kind of the most exciting thing that you've seen? What's what's gotten what has you excited about this coming year? 